It's another day here at the Comeback Team Studios. This is your host, Beck Lover. And today we bring you an extraordinary story of a man who started out his life the wrong way in the cocaine business, ended up doing 26 years in prison. Now he's been out for a few years. He's working on some amazing things. And we're here to tell you the comeback story of all comeback stories. I'm here with my new friend, Michael Santos. Welcome to the show, my brother. Beck, thanks for having me on. I look forward to uh, contributing to the comeback team. Michael, it's nice to have you. I know you're on uh, West Coast time right now. I'm tired. It's like 10 in the morning here, but I want to thank you for being an early bird. Yeah, you got to start early. When you go through 26 years in prison, you don't have a minute to waste. So I'm at it every day. Well, we're going to jump into that, your, your extraordinary story. But what time were they waking you up when you were in jail? Well, they didn't wake me up. You know, when you got, you got to be the kind of, uh, kind of my whole process is you got to be the CEO of your own life and you get up when you're ready. So, uh, in, in, in fact, I, I, I wrote stories about that, that I would get up at like one o'clock in the morning and start working at that time frame because I was always so focused on preparing for success that I had a pattern. I'd go to bed at like five o'clock in the afternoon. When people were awake, that was the time for me to be sleeping because I wanted to avoid all the chaos and the negativity of prison. I'd get up at one o'clock in the morning and start working on this personal development process that I had. And so by the time, uh, you know, six o'clock in the morning when the unit started to wake up, I was already really had, had accomplished quite a bit and uh, just focused on the process that I had. So the, the, I, I was in prison for a long time, but I was always driving my own ship and preparing for the success that I was determined to become. I love it. So before we get into, and I really want to get into what it was like in there and you know, who, who better to give some experience there, but let's talk first about your early life, where your life starts, you know, your background and how you ended up ending up in prison. Yeah. So I always like to say I didn't end up in prison. I went there and it started because I made some really bad decisions as a kid. And those bad decisions really uh, started, I'd, I'd like to say it was when I started selling cocaine, but the reality is, you know, as a child, I just wasn't really making good decisions. I was not choosing the friends that were, that would be good influences on me. I was not listening to my parents. I was Let, not listening let's go, to- let's, let's go back. Okay. Where, where does your life start? I mean, tell us about your background, your parents, where you're from. I mean, give sure. me, start, literally start from the beginning. So my father escaped from Cuba and he built his life in eventually escaped from Cuba to Miami during the, when Castro took over the island, I guess. Then he started in Miami for a little while, moved to uh, Southern California looking for better opportunities. And that's where he met my mother, who's American. And so he didn't speak English and she didn't speak Spanish, but he learned to speak English. They learned to communicate. They fell in love. They had uh, two children in Southern California, my older sister, Julie, and me. Um, then by the time I was in, I think I was probably still an infant, maybe four or five, um, they moved to Seattle because there were better work opportunities. My father was a, an electrician and he uh, started a small business in Seattle and that's where I grew up. So we grew up in North Seattle on the north side of Lake Washington. And he was just a small business man that uh, built a, a little electrical contracting business with my mom helping him. I would work with him as a child. Uh, you know, he, he was really as a, as a Latin immigrant, his goal was to kind of build a better life for his family. Um, and so he would take me with him on whenever I, I was not in school to, to, to learn how to be a laborer or to work with him. And I hated it <laughs> always. Um, so by the time I was in high school, I made a lot of bad decisions. As I said, wrong friends, bad decisions was always kind of in trouble. And how were you uh, grade wise? I mean, were you, were you a good student at least, or you just, no, just all I was, around? I was a me me mediocre student, not, not taking the importance of preparation seriously. And so just getting by, um, in everything, right? Whether it was sports, whether it was school, whatever, I was always looking for a fast and easier way. And that, of course, can, that, that mindset contributes to a person's character and what a person becomes. And so I 
molded my way much to the, I think, to the disappointment of my family. They loved me, of course, but I was making bad decisions as a kid. If I could stop you there for one second. It seems like your father was very proactive with you. I mean, he was trying to, to instill into you a good work ethic. So I don't think it has anything to do with, you know, bad parenting. So what do you think? No, he, he, he had the immigrant mindset and a mindset of work hard, live honorably, build a good life, which is what he did. I was just influenced by, and I, we lived in a good area. So there's no excuse. I didn't have, uh, there's nobody to blame but myself. Were for your what friends, I, was doing. I mean, were they, uh, and see, uh, this not, is not, I wouldn't call them at risk youth. No, we were all, it was really kind of an affluent area of North Seattle. But we were not doing homework. We were the kids chasing girls. We were the kids looking to party, looking to kids having a good time. And, you know, uh, that's who I was as a 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year old, 15 year old. And what by the time I got out of high school, you know, felt like I was kind of an entitled kid. Any that, drug use, any drinking during those years in, in high school? Yeah, a little drinking, not, not serious drug use. I was much more motivated by a faster life and um, trying to make money and doing things, whatever it was, it didn't matter. So uh, that's why I think why I was inclined by the time I was 20, I saw that movie Scarface and it really influenced me. Um, looked like I didn't know much of anything about the drug business, but I saw that movie and I kind of identified with, with Al Pacino because he sounded like my dad. You thought that was a good Cuban accent? A lot of people say it wasn't that great. Well, I don't speak Spanish. So for me, it sounded just like my dad. <laughs> um, yeah, to me, it did. I mean, in fact, when I've I met, heard, I've met three of, of the characters in that movie. Uh, Al Pacino, the guy that played Chichi, and uh, the guy that played Manolo. I've actually met them in real life. Let me ask yeah. you this. You watching that movie and seeing how it ended for Tony, that didn't scare the shit out of you? No, it got me kind of excited. It looked like a life of fun and excitement, and and uh, that's what got me started in this in this venture. Literally, so, you feel like that was the point where you're like, "I want to be a gangster." No, I never saw myself as a gangster. Just ever, a, a, like you wanted to be like a, 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 a drug lord. I didn't see myself as a drug lord. I saw myself because I I did not see myself as a criminal at that time in my life. I was 20 years old. I saw there were people that wanted it. I could find people that sold it and there was a spread. And I actually deluded myself into believing if I didn't touch it, I wasn't really breaking the law. And I had a plan. And the plan was I'm going to make, I think at the time I said I was going to try and make $2 million dollars. And I could take that $2 million and then start my life. That would be enough capital I'd need to start my life. So it was a series of really bad planning and engineering and moral, bad moral compass that put me on this path. That, as I said, it didn't start with me selling cocaine. It started with the choices that I was making when I was 12 that made it so that I could see a movie like Scarface and not see what everybody else saw that this has a really bad ending. Did and so you, I made bad decisions. So before you, and I want to, you know, take us through how you started doing what you were doing. Were you working at all? Were you doing, I mean, what were you doing for money? Yeah. So my father, I told you had a contracting business and I really was, I grew up alongside him and, but it was not glamorous for me. You know, I wanted to be like other kids in my area that I, with whom I associated that had uh, a lot more liberty and freedom of time. And it, it wasn't dirty work that I considered to be, you know, getting your hands dirty and dealing with wires and pipes and ditches and things. Uh, Break your back, your hard work, you know? Yeah. I, to me, that wasn't what I wanted to do, but neither did I have the good character to say, well, let's go to school, get an education and become a contributing member of society in something that I could find meaning in and find and, and value. I didn't have the good character to do that at that age. So I made bad decisions and there's nobody to blame but myself. But the reality is I made bad decisions. I, I could have worked for my father and continued in the role of 
a, a first son and taking over the business. But it became more exciting to me to think I could meet the supply and demand issue and, uh, and pursue that path. And uh, it had a predictable bad outcome for me. So can you take us through the first time you actually, I mean, did you, did you succeed or were you busted the first time? I mean, take oh. us through, take us through what happened in that, in that, in that. So part I was of your 20 life. years old and I had some convert. I knew people that used drug that used cocaine. This is nine. We're talking in 1985 at this time. It's the heyday. So I knew people that were using cocaine and I used to go to nightclubs and things of that sort. And I just had this kind of basic common sense that if you used cocaine, you had to buy cocaine. And if you bought cocaine, you had to know somebody that was selling cocaine. And so I just asked, find out, do you know what? I asked a couple of people that, that, that I knew, do you know anybody that buys cocaine in quantity? Like a lot of it by the kilogram. And I uh, found out that they did. And I said, well, what is the price for that? What, are the, what is the going rate here in Seattle? And those questions led me to get an answer. And that answer was like $50,000 a kilogram. In and this is in the 80s. 1985. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money. Um, Just but to I didn't get have it, any, I, mean. I, I didn't have a, an idea of what that meant. All I knew is that's what people would pay for a kilogram in 1985. And so then I, my, my father had escaped with another guy from Cuba and that guy had grown up in Miami. His name was Tony. And so I called Tony, who's, he had a son, Tony Jr. It was my age. And I think just had this reasoning. If you grow up in Miami and you go to Miami schools all your life, you probably know somebody that sells cocaine. So I just called him and I asked him, well, what is the price of cocaine in Miami by the kilogram? And of course he knew a lot of people and he called me back and said, it's $20,000. And, and so I could just immediately see, wow, there's $30,000 difference between the price it would cost in Miami and the price it would sell for in Seattle. And then I just figured, okay, I could put a few people together that would fly down there, pick it up, drive it back. And I could pay them a lot of money for them which might be $5,000 or something like that. So my total cost would be 25,000, but there would be a buyer for, for 50,000. And that's how it got started for me. And so the first deal I went and What a crazy spread though. I mean, wow, $30,000 difference, a key. A key. And then when you think about doing- Such a big them, difference though. I mean, I mean, you would figure once it's in the US, why the hell is there that much of a difference? Well, this price? is the start of the, uh, this is the start of really the 80s, the disco era- um, cocaine's a fashionable drug. This is before crack. This is a time that it's perceived as a, an afflu a drug for the affluent and people wanted that. And, and that was, and, and Seattle's very far from Miami, right? So yeah, there's, there's a risk to get it there. And, uh, that was just, I, I, and I, and frankly, I don't think that the, that the rate in Miami at 20,000 or so was um normal it was just because this guy knew people in miami he could get it for that price and that and plus was there that, was probably more than one source down there too it wasn't just the Colombians. it was it, it was, was Cubans, at that time was miami was the at capital. that time miami was the hub of the entire nation so all the cocaine came in from colombian people through cuban smugglers into miami and then it was dispersed to new york and la and every place else and then of course that changed over time but this is the very start of the drug cocaine drug problem in the United States. And so that's when I got started and I started doing transactions. And the first transaction I think was for 10 kilograms. So I did it with a partner to, 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 to who helped me with the money. And we each made like a hundred thousand dollars on that very first deal. And that changed my life when I was 20 years old. So when you're 20 years old and you put together from a phone conversation to maybe three weeks later, you're sitting on $100,000 in cash. It made me believe that I could do this. And, uh, and 100 Gs in the 80s is like 250 today, you know? Probably more than that. I maybe, mean, maybe put even it, more. Put, put, yeah, put it into perspective, right? I mean, you could buy a brand new 911 Porsche for like 35000 back then. Mm. So 
you know, it, it was, it, it was, it was starting. And, and that was something I made in like three weeks. So you figure, oh, I can do this every couple of weeks and I, I, I'll be done in three months, four months, I'll have a couple million dollars. But it didn't work out that way. What did it feel like to get that money the first time? And do you remember saying, man, it's working? I mean, what was going through your mind when you made that first score? Yeah, it, it's, it was a, it was a problem for me because I made that money and I believed then I, then that's what started me living a web of lies where I had to lie to my family and, 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 and begin trying to scale that business or that scheme is probably a better world word. And with that money, I would start enticing other friends of mine that I, with money to be the person that took the risk where they would go to Miami, transport it back. They would store it. They would meet with people because I didn't want to do anything. And I thought if I didn't do anything, I believed that I wasn't really breaking the law, not understanding the law and not understanding that I was actually exposing myself to a much more severe penalty by doing it that way. Yeah, because you're basically like the kingpin. You're, you're the organizer. That's the actual charge that I got. So yeah. I didn't understand that because I'd never been arrested before. I'd never been in custody before. And... I lived that world and there were ups and downs. So there were times when I'd put together, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, and then there'd be a loss and I'd lose five hundred thousand and then I'd have to start over again. And Why? Because they would raid, they would, I mean. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I was not a real criminal in the sense of I wouldn't, I never had a weapon. I wouldn't enforce things. I wouldn't enforce violence. And, and so that's not that exposes you to being ripped off. Um, and, uh, and that happened. People wouldn't pay. And I, what am I going to go shoot somebody? I, I, I wouldn't do that. So I lost. I just, okay, well, you know, I lose, lose and move on. And as a result, there were ups and downs. People would get arrested. I'd lose that money. Um, people that were, people business. that were transporting for you. Got arrested? Uh, nobody got transported like that, but people that bought, you know, somebody, because I would allow them to take it on credit. And if they, if something happened and they couldn't pay or they wouldn't pay, I had no recourse, right? You can't do anything. What are you going to call the police? Did you call can't the call the Albanians. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to do that, I didn't want to get nah, involved. I know. You, didn't want blood on your like you didn't want blood I, on your I didn't, like I said, to me, I deluded myself into saying I wasn't really a criminal. I was a like to see myself as being a businessman or something along those lines. And I was just fooling myself and setting myself up for a very heavy fall. And that fall came on August the 11th, 1987, when I got arrested. So we just kind of passed the anniversary of that, huh? Yeah, so that was actually 30, what, how many years ago? Um, I, I was arrested. And then I and then I sub subsequently was in prison for for who a arrested for 95 you? Days. Pardon? Who arrested you? Which agency? So initially, how I got arrested were other people got arrested along the way, and when they got arrested, they could mitigate their thing by cooperating with the government, and they told that I was the leader or I put it together, and so I didn't know there was an investigation going on of me. Um, I later learned in earlier that year of 87 that there was, and I, and I, and I tried to flee and, and, and go start my life in Europe. But who was so it? Was, was it the DEA? Was it the FBI? Was it? Yeah, it was the DEA. So the DEA came, I was living in Key Biscayne, South Florida at the time. And the DEA came to my place and three agents with their guns pointed at my head and, uh, you know, put your hands behind your head. And, and, and that was it. That was the, that was the end of my Liberty for 9,500 days. Do you remember what went through your mind at that second when they arrested you the first Ironically, time? Ironically, what went through my mind is relief because it's a funny thing. When I was, before I was a cocaine trafficker, I, I, I distinctly still remember this, driving down the road and I'd see some guy not too much older than I was. I was 20. Maybe see some guy who was 22, 24, successful, you know, driving a Porsche or, you know, for whatever. And I'd look at him and I'd say, man, what a great life. Super life, super cool. I wish I was doing that. I'm probably driving a pickup truck or something with wires and, and shovels in the back. And then I became a cocaine trafficker and I had, you know, 
a lot of liquidity, uh, great cars and, you know. How long did you last? I mean, total. Like a year and a half. Okay. So 18 months of this fake life. And I remember about a year into it, I'm saying to myself, I wish I could get out of this. Okay. Because I, I don't have, I don't have stability. I don't have, I'm 20, now I'm 23 or 22. I'm 22. I think it's time. And I'm just saying to myself, God, I don't have, I'm, I'm a liar. I feel embarrassed. Um, I know I've got no purpose. I don't like being a criminal. I know I'm a criminal. I know I've broken the law and I'm, I'm saying, how am I going to get out of this? Right. How am I going to get out of this life? Cause I can't run away from the fact that I've sold hundreds of kilograms and those people are getting caught. And when they're getting caught, I'm vulnerable. They can tell on me and I don't know how I'm going to get away from that. And it does, and it, and it seems like there's no way out. There's no way for me to be free, and so I'm troubled by that mentally. And um, I remember then saying, "God, I wish I could just go back to school. I wish I could just forget this and start my life, but I can't. And no amount of money is going to change that." So it was very troubling. And then I got arrested. And so you ask me, what did I feel? I felt relief. I felt like, okay, this is finally going to be over. I'll probably have to go to prison. Maybe I'll be in prison for a year or two years or three years, and I'll go to college and I'll become a better person. Didn't work out that way because I got arrested and I went into the prison system and I only wanted to get out of prison. I I, I didn't think, I didn't yet have epiphany in saying, I've got to express responsibility. I've got to express remorse. I've got to move on in a clean way. Instead, I asked my lawyer, well, what's it going to take for me to get out of here? Because all I wanted was to get out of jail. Well, well, what did they end up charging you with? I was charged with what's called a, a 848, a continuing criminal enterprise, which is the kingpin statute, the most severe drug case. Um, and I was facing life in prison without the possibility of parole. When you f- realize now at this point, because you said you felt relief, but then when you realize what the charges are against you, what did you feel at that point? When you I thought it was life- absurd. I thought, I, I thought there's no way that's just to scare me because they wanted me to cooperate against other people. And so they put, I figured they just put this charge to scare me and I'd had this lawyer. And I told the lawyer at the time, so I initially I feel relief. Then I meet with the lawyer and I say, I don't care if I plead guilty or I go to trial. I'm going to let you make that decision of what's the best thing for me. I just won't cooperate against anybody. I said that I won't do, but I'm prepared to go to trial. If you tell me that's the right thing to do, I'm prepared to plead guilty if that's the right thing to do. Um, Because in my head, I think I'm going to be in prison for maybe two or three years. And he says, you're facing life without the possibility of parole. It's crazy. But he says, there's no violent there's crime. Big... You never hurt nobody. You never killed nobody. Obviously... Well, he says the important thing here, the important thing here, Beck, is to say that's how I saw it. But that's not how the government sees it. Right. And, and, and so when we face a problem, it's important that we look at the problem from the other person's perspective. And from the other person's perspective, they're saying, because that's what I would argue. Hey, I I didn't ever have a gun. I I didn't hurt anybody. They were all consenting adults. This is their decision. But the prosecutors look at it from a different perspective. They say, well, actually that makes you worse because you were the organizer and you put this together and other people did have guns and that wouldn't have happened if you didn't play that role. And so you've contributed to this poison being spread throughout our com- country and we're holding you responsible for that. And we all and know what ha- happened. We ha- know what happened in Colombia, Escobar, the people that worked. I mean, no matter what, if you sell an illegal drug, there's blood on it, even if you don't have a gun. And I agree with that. You're right. You're absolutely correct about that. So I didn't have the, I didn't have the maturity to process that when I was 20 or 23. 
The, I didn't have the educational, the philosophical background. I didn't get it. I wanted to make excuses for myself and I wanted to get out. I wanted to pretend that it didn't happen. And so I told my lawyer that I, I, won't pl- I, I will plead guilty because I am guilty. If you think that's the best thing to do, I just won't cooperate against anybody. And he said, well, there's a big difference between an indictment and a conviction. And with the right amount of money, you can win. So I said, great. Isn't it amazing what money can do? (laughs) It was the wrong advice. He was telling me what I wanted to hear, not what I needed to hear. And that's a problem because I needed somebody to be honest with me and say, you've made some really bad decisions. You're in some very big trouble. And the best thing that we can do right now is start, you want a clean slate? Let me show you how to get a clean slate. You, you, you don't necessarily have to cooperate, but you do have to accept responsibility. You do have to express remorse. You do have to identify with the victims of your crime. And I would say, well, there are no victims. You know, they were all consenting adults, but that's the wrong way to look at it. I said, I got to start from a different perspective. And I needed a coach at that time. I needed somebody to help me understand how do I get through to the other side with my dignity intact and with an opportunity to make amends with society. What, what, what can I do? And if I started asking those kinds of questions, I would have had a different outcome. Let me ask you a question. Where's your, what, what, what's your, I mean, your parents, do they know at this point what's going on? Did you, were you ever married during this time? I mean, what was the personal life like while you're incarcerated? So I am making every decision that was consistent with the goal. And the goal was to get that couple million dollars spread. That's how I started, right? So I am lying to my parents. I am, I get married to a woman that is, you know, flamboyant um, like me, (laughs) you know? I mean, I'm driving the car, the cars. I've got a cigarette race boat. During that time, during the time you had the money. Yeah. Before I get arrested. So you were Um, married at, you were married at that point. Yeah. I got married to this woman and, you know, I'm going out every night to nightclubs and wearing, you know, the high end jewelry and driving the exotic cars and living the life of that kid, right? Living the life, not really understanding what I am doing, not being responsible and making it a guarantee that I'm going to get convicted if I ever get in trouble because a jury, right, of postal workers and nurses and firemen see this 22 year old kid living in a, you know, high rise oceanfront apartment with a race cigarette race boat and driving, you know, a Ferrari one month and a Porsche the next month. And, you know, I'm guilty just for that, (laughs) you know, just for that, because I've got no visible source of income. Right. But I'm living this life and it's very easily provable. In my head, I'm thinking to myself, well, they didn't catch me with anything. There's no phone calls. There's no drugs. They didn't catch anything. I don't recognize the lifestyle itself is evidence. <laughs> and that evidence to a jury is incontrovertible. And so I was in trouble. And I didn't appreciate the, the, the depth of trouble I was in. And my lawyer had his own agenda. And that was to very surgically separate me from all the money that I had earned And that way that he did that is by allowing me to go to trial and not explaining to me the real danger and the best way out. And the best way out would have been to accept responsibility, express remorse, identify with the victims of the crime, um, show that I really understood that I had made some very bad decisions. But I didn't do that. Is there a point that you have to tell your parents what's going on? Yeah, I think think that happens while I'm going through – after the trial. So what happens is I go through, I'm arrested. I'm locked inside of detention centers. And from the day of my arrest, the woman that I was married to, understandably, you know, decides that, well, she's with me, I think through the trial. Yeah. So it wasn't until I was going to, so I'm in, I'm in pre what's called pre-trial custody for a year in jail. And facing life without parole. And I go through trial 
and I'm convicted at trial. That's when I have a life-changing moment as I realize I've really made some bad decisions, really. My parents are humiliated. My grandparents don't speak with me. I'm on the cover of the newspaper um, and I'm embarrassed because I'd made every bad decision a kid could make. First of all, uh, lacking the good character as a child to make good to mature into a good person, selling drugs. When I get caught selling drugs, don't take responsibility, but lie and uh, go to trial, even though I know I'm guilty. And I, and I, and, and I have this epiphany because I started, I won't turn this into a religious program, but I mean, I mean, you're in a jail cell, you start praying and I'm not asking God to get me out because I know I'm not going to get out. You know, I'm convicted. That ship has sailed. It's more along the lines of give me the strength to get through this. And that prayer led me to what I needed at that moment. And that was, it led me to a philosophy book. It's, it's not too far from your area of the world, Albania. I actually started reading a, a Greek philosopher, Socrates, in a jail cell. And that story changed my life. And it changed the way I looked at life. So let's backtrack that, for one second. I'm sorry to cut you off. And we're going to get back to Socrates in a minute. When you're sentenced, and now you know you're going to be spending, you know, that you know, you realize when you're sentenced how long you're going to be in there. Right, they to, they told you. You understood it. I'm not sentenced yet. Oh, this is happening sentenced. before I'm sentenced. I'm okay. convicted. So, so this is the first year. This is I've been in custody for a year, fighting it. I get convicted. Now there's like a four month period before I'm sentenced. No, I'm still in custody. I'm locked in a cell, and that's when my life changes. But for four months, you have to sit there and wait. What's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen. I know I'm I'm facing life in prison. Wow. Okay, so you you pick up Socrates. Why out of all the what did this? How did that even pop into your mind, Socrates? Well, I was pr I, I will say that I was praying, and I now I'm afraid. Now I know I did wrong. Now I'm convicted. Now my whole strategy I can see was just a stupid strategy. Every step of it was stupid. And I, I, I realized that my lawyer gave me really bad guidance by telling me to go to trial, by telling me I could win. Because I by then I had seen, you know, dozens of people testifying against me. And it was pretty clear that the jury was going to believe them and not believe me. How many people cooperated against you? I can't remember now, but I would say at least 10, probably uh, that's 10 people that had direct relationships with me. Yeah, that'll make you a selling. kingpin. That'll make you a kingpin. Okay, at least 10. But besides those 10, the government probably put on 50 witnesses because they would put on bankers that would talk about money I deposited. They would put on uh, people that I rented condominiums from that I would give them, you know, twenty five or thirty thousand dollars in cash to pay for the condo rent in advance, you know, and that's just not a normal thing that somebody would do. So that's evidence. It didn't occur to me the way that they could easily build a case against me. Um, so I, I was convicted, and when I saw all of that, I'm in the jail cell and I'm just reflecting my God, I've, I've really put myself in a bad situation and I wanted to get better. And that's when I started to pray. And that was those prayers that I will say led me to that philosophy book because I would have never picked up a philosophy book. <laughs> so there's a bookshelf, right, in prison and I'm praying every day and every night, God, give me strength, you know, help me through this. I, gotta, I know I'm going to prison now. I don't know how long. I know I'm going to prison. There's a slogan that they say, through despair comes enlightenment. Yeah. And, and, and I agree with that. You know, uh, it brings a clarity of thought. For me, it did. It doesn't for everybody. I was blessed to uh, asking God, give me what I need right now to get through this. And, and, and so when I'm looking through this bookshelf, I, I, there's like, I see this, these two books called The Treasury of Philosophy 
and they're big books. They're heavy books. At that time, I don't know how to spell philosophy. I certainly don't know what it means, but they're calling to me. These are the books that you need right now. And I pick those two books up. I take them to my cell and I start reading. And when I read the story of Socrates, he's in jail facing his execution. And that's the only reason I read that story because I could identify with him. Wow, he's in jail, I'm in jail. Let me see what I can learn from him. And that book changed the, changed the way that I thought. And think about how old that book is, huh? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's a relevant point. It's 2,500 years ago, but it also shows me that as human beings, we all go through struggle and we all go through challenges and trying times, but there's always a way through. And we need to look at those people who understood how to get through struggle and recalibrate to become better. And we all can follow that path. So those four months you're in there, you're reading. I think philosophy, definitely probably a very important subject. I wish I would have paid attention more in college. I, I cut a lot of classes in school. I'm not going to lie. I hope my kid doesn't watch this, but he probably will. But I did do really well in school, right? I mean, I achieved what I wanted to, but that's not the point. You see, a grade doesn't mean you learned something. Just because you got an A, you know, you studied real quick, it doesn't mean you absorbed the information like when you want to read something and you want to learn something. And I can agree with you. I think philosophy, when you read Socrates and um, Nietzsche and all these different people, you really start, you, you can start taking your mind to places it never went before, thinking in different ways and seeing things from a different perspective. That's the beauty of reading that I don't think a lot of young people appreciate. They look at it like a punishment. Ah, man, I got to study. Ah, man, I got to read. Where I look at it now, I wish I had the time to read as much as I want to read because it really does impact your life. And the most successful people in the world, when we look at them, they read even now. They're billionaires and all they do is read. And, and now it's easier because even if you don't, and, and we live in a different era, right? Where it's, the, it, we're busy and we're always on the move and we can make excuses that we don't have time to read. But now you can listen and learn on audiobooks while you're driving. You could be reading and consuming. You could be listening to, um, you know, stories of people overcoming adversity. You could be listening to the comeback team and hearing stories of people that have gone through challenges and struggles and say, well, what lessons can I take from that story and that message and put it into my life, right? You can pursue that path of learning and growing, or you can choose to keep up with the Kardashians. I mean, we all make a choice and we choose whether we want to grow and become stronger and more enlightened, or we choose to pursue a path of glitter than without recognizing that all that glitter is not gold. And the gold is in the message that we get from leaders like Socrates. Take me to the day you sentenced. Do you remember it? I do. So what was that like? Do you remember that morning? Do you remember how you felt? Do you I mean, sure? It, it's probably more uh, helpful to go a little be before that when okay. I had when I read Socrates and what happened. So when I read Socrates. It, it, it helped me appreciate, and this is long before I'm sentenced. This is a month and a half, maybe two months before I'm sentenced. And when I read that story, I recognized that I personally had a very bad philosophy. I was only thinking about myself and only thinking about living this fast life and not thinking about the relationship that my decisions had on the broader community. So at that moment, now I start to see what people are saying, that my decisions, I may delude myself into believing there's no violence and there's no, you know, I, I didn't do anything wrong. There's no victims. Well, that story helped me see, no, you were trafficking in something that hurt people. And, and you were doing it for one reason, to make easy money. It was very different from Socrates. Socrates was in prison because he believed in teaching people. He believed in helping people reach their highest potential. I, and, and he was willing to die for that. Whereas I was in prison, not because I was trying to help other people. I was trying to help me and, and foolishly pursuing a path that led to destruction. And so I had that epiphany when I was in that jail cell. And when I did, I said, okay, that's it. I'm going to change my life. And I need to be 
very transparent about that. And so I, I remember in the jail cell getting up and writing a letter to the newspaper because the newspaper had been covering me as a kingpin. And I wrote a letter to the journalist and I said, look, I made a lot of really bad decisions and I regret those decisions, including going to trial. And I wish that I had chosen things differently and there's nothing I can do about the past, but I'm gonna change my future. And if you guys wanna know the story of what I did and how I did it, I'll tell you, you know? And so that led to the journalist coming to the jail and interviewing me and, 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 a, and a very big front page story in the newspaper. And in that story, that's what I said. I would spend every day of my life in prison working to atone and working to make things right and to reconcile with society because I made bad decisions and I want to do better. And I know I have to earn that, the right to be an American citizen again, because I, I, I did not appreciate it the first time. And I'm not asking anybody to forgive me. I'm not asking to get out of jail. I'm not asking for that. I know I'm going to prison, but this is the way that I can show I want to be better. And that led to this front page story. And of course, when somebody reads that story from a guy that's in jail facing life in prison, they look at it very cynically. Oh, and that's what yeah, happened. Like, like oh, all of a sudden now. Yeah, you're sure he's saying that, right? So I go to tr sentencing. And the judge read the whole article because it came out just before my sentencing. And I remember the prosecutor got up before sentencing is imposed. And he said that Michael Santos says he's going to change his life. I'll always remember this sentence. He says that he is going to become better. But we believe that if he spends every day of his life in an all-consuming effort to repay society, we believe the society, and if he lives to be 300 years old, mm. we believe the society will still be at a significant net loss. And I remember when he said that, it was like, for me, again, a sense of relief because I know where I'm going. I'm going into a world that extinguishes hope. And it says, you have no hope. You have nothing which means I've hit bottom. And when you've hit bottom, there's only one thing to do and that's start climbing up. And then the judge sentenced me to 45 years in prison. And so I didn't know how to process that, right? I, I was 23. I don't know how to process 45 years. I mean, I don't know even about this thing called good time, right? All I know is I got sentenced to 45 years, but at least it has a date. It's 45 years. <laughs> It's got clarity. And so I said, okay, this is the bottom. This is the bottom. And I can climb. And so I was 23 and I kind of did the math and I said, 45, I said, that's like 70 years old. I'll get out of prison. And I don't believe that. I refuse to believe that. I, I, I start thinking to myself, okay, I got to focus on what I can control. I can't control that. But I said, in the first 10 years, that's what I'm going to pro focus on. What's going to be different in my life in 10 years? And that's what changes everything for me because I start thinking, okay, I got to take incremental steps to be fundamentally different in 10 years from who I am today. Were your parents be there? I mean, was anyone at the trial that you cared about? Oh, yeah, yeah. My family was there. Tell us about and that conversation, man. Do you remember? Well, I don't have a conversation because I'm in jail, right? I'm in custody and I, I, they're in the court, so I can't converse with them. There was never a chance for you to talk to your parents? I mean, when you were Oh, yeah, I, and visiting and things of that sort throughout. But, but remember, now I've had this change and they just want me to be strong, right? They're afraid for me as a parent would be and sad and you they never want to see it. that happen to your kid man it, it breaks your heart you know yeah i'm my no father how bad you son. were no matter how bad yeah, and you they, were and, and they don't you know i i by then i admit to them that, that that it was true i did all these things and they knew right but i'd been lying to them to their face so i you know you have this period of remorse and contrition and i express my sorrow and my humiliation and I'm going to do better. And I, I started saying, I'm going to do better. And it doesn't matter if I'm in there for 30 years or 20 years or 40 years or whatever they put me, I'm going to do better. But I have strength, right? I asked God for strength and God gave me strength. That's what I asked for. I didn't ask to get out of jail. 
give me the strength to make amends. And I had a very strong mindset that said, I'm going to do, I'm going to get out of here with my dignity intact and I'm going to make things right. And that's what put me on a path to figure out, okay, what's going to be different in 10 years. And that's what I focused on. And then I, my focus was, okay, in 10 years, I'm going to have at least, I'm going to have an education, a university degree. I'm going to have uh, I'm going to build a record of contributing to society, which means I'm going to, be, and that eventually said, I'm going to become within 10 years, I will be a published author. And then it was said, I'm going to build a support network. I'm going to find people that don't know me and I'm going to persuade them to see me as something other than a drug dealer or a drug or a prisoner. And those are the three prongs that are going to get me through this 10 years. And if I can do that, I believed I would be stronger in 10 years and I would be in a position to perhaps influence an earlier release date. And that was the path. So your mindset, uh, phenomenal for the situation you're going into. It's almost Joseph-like, if you, if you know the reference uh, in the scripture. Do. That I mean, obviously, very different why he ended up being thrown down a well sure. and sold into slavery and then thrown into a prison. Well, he inspired me, too. Those were the stories that I was reading. But inspiration of patience, having patience and never losing hope. So if you ask God for what you need and you don't ask for, you know, a... Um, you know, a new Patek Philippe watch or something, and you ask God, let me be a better person. I think God shows us the way. And to learn the way for me, it was really about stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about what you can do to make things right. And that's what made the difference for me. And what did you end up spending your time? I mean, were you in a federal prison? Where, 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 where were you located? Yeah, I mean, so talk, after, talk to us a little I bit got, about that. After I got sentenced to 45 years, they had to send me to a high security penitentiary because that was the classification system. If you had a sentence of that length, that's where you started. So I went to a uh, United States penitentiary in Georgia. And I, as soon as I got there, I felt as if I've got the plan and I know what I'm going to do. And that's when I learned that on 45 years, I could get out in 26 years. So that already felt like, wow, this is great. I've only got 26 years. It's almost half, <laughs> you know, almost half. It's like, and I'm going to do better. But put that into perspective. Like this is 2020. You so say you're going in, you're not going to get out until 2046. <laughs> it's wow. a long time. Yeah, man. But I thought, okay, but I can get my head around it. I'm still going to focus on the first 10 years. And so I get... I immediately, the first day I'm in the penitentiary, I go to the library and I start looking for, for schools where I could go to school because I wanted to get an education. And I start writing to universities and I ask them, let, I tell them the story. I made really bad decisions. I was a terrible student in high school. I've been sentenced to 45 year sentence and I really want to get an education, but I don't have any money. The government took all of my money because it was drug money. And so I, I, I have to start and, and can I start? And, and, and so it's like you're fishing and you're trying to find a way. And so I wrote, you know, you send one letter out, you probably don't get a response. You send 10 letters out, you probably don't get a response. And this is before email. There's no email. This is before the internet. That's yeah, correct. I'm, is, so I want yeah. to put, but keep that in, in the uh, audience's mind. That yeah, is. this is nothing using nothing but a pen and a piece of paper. And so you're writing a lot of letters and I wrote my templated letter. My name is Michael Santos. I'm in prison. I really want to get an education, but I don't have any money. Is there any possible way of me going to school? I want to be a good student. I want to be a good person and I need an education to do it. Please help me. And I sent that hundreds of those letters out until I found a, a possibility. And I got into university and that changed my life. Once I got my books, which I one? wasn't a, a prisoner anymore. I felt like a, a, a student. Which place accepted you? The first, I started at Ohio University, and then I got my degree from Mercer University in Atlanta. Wow. What did it feel and like then, when they said, yeah, well, I mean, so they did it for free? Yeah. Well, so at the time, there was a, a grant 
it still exists, but it, but it was available to people in prison called the Pell Grant. And the Pell Grant is provides tuition funding for people that don't have a certain income level. So it's for, for, for people that, 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 are, that have, are low income. But as a prisoner, I had no income. So I qualified for that grant. And so the university got the money through that Pell Grant. And then my family would send me the books that I needed. And that's how I got through undergraduate school. And I was very fortunate to have done that because um, later the Pell Grant through legislation was changed that it wasn't available to people in prison. So, so I how are you taking these classes? I mean, you, you, you're incarcerated. They, so, I mean, are they so coming they, to you? Are you going to them? I mean, how, how's the this university happen? would send me the books and the coursework in the mail. And they structured a program that allowed me to, to get my, to complete the assignments. And instead of, uh, I could proct if there were, ex if there were courses that required an exam, I could get a proctor. So somebody from the education department could receive the exam and they just had to watch me take it and they would send it in. Um, but many of the assignments were more um, uh, essay type. I'd have to respond to demonstrate my mastery of the subject matter. And, and uh, which was good for me because it really helped me develop stronger writing and communication skills and comprehension skills and critical thinking skills, which were very important for me to make it through this journey and to position myself for success upon release. So, so right I got it. You found the, the, you found something productive to do with that time instead of letting it just, just sit in there and decay. You yeah, well, within, within four years. So I'd set this goal in 10 years, I was going to accomplish these things. And by the time I had my fourth year in, I got my undergraduate degree and then I, I wanted to go to law school. So I started to write to law schools all across the country. And uh, I couldn't get into law school while I was in prison. But one of the schools, Hofstra University in New York, wrote yes. me back to law, the law school at Hofstra, wrote me back and said, well, we can't let you into law school because you've got to be on campus to study law, but you can get a master's degree. And in our graduate school, if you know, we, we admire what you've done and we want to support you, but you can't go to law school. Would you want to get a, a master's degree? And I said, I would. And they said, what do you want to study? And this was in 19, early 1990s now. And I really believed that mass incarceration was a big societal problem. And I said, I want to contribute to that. And so that led me to um, get a, enrolled at, at Hofstra in a interdisciplinary program to where I would study cultural anthropology and political science and sociology. And that resulted in me getting a master's degree in my eighth year of imprisonment. It's amazing. And, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, it really changed my life. And then I began- I mean, you have more education than me. You understand that. I went to college. Yeah. You did it behind well, bars. There's no excuses to those out there. And it, yeah, I mean, and so all thanks, I say to that prayer that I had in God, because God guided me and opened those opportunities. And then I, and simultaneously, I was becoming an author. So I began publishing papers in, first of all, I built my support network with academics, and they were authors of textbooks. And I would write to them and tell them I'm in prison and I'm studying and, you know, I want to learn from you. And that developed a relationship and they would come to visit me in prison and they'd invite me to contribute chapters to their books. And they opened relationships with me with other academics. And so my support network was growing and I was contributing to society by publishing. And then I was uh, building my life and I felt as if I wasn't in prison. I felt as if I were doing something meaningful and building a contribution, a contributing life, even though I was in prison. And so that carried me through the first decade. And, <clears throat> and, then, I, and then I was getting a PhD in prison. And I went through the first year, but then the warden stopped me. So that, remember, this is the dawn of mass incarceration. This is the mid 1990s. And the warden said, people don't want prisoners getting PhDs. And so <clears throat> he stopped me. And the way that he could stop me is he'd block the books from coming into the mailroom that I needed. So I couldn't complete my coursework. 
after my first year of the PhD program. No and offense, sh- but um, that was his decision? Well, he had control of the mailroom. So- I understand that, but that's something that he, it wasn't like it was dictated by the governor. It was just he he felt that way. They have the authority to do that. Yeah, that's He correct. felt that way. That he, was, uh, he's the CEO of the prison. Yeah. Um, and, he sounds like, no offense, but he sounds like an asshole. Well, I, I, I've written a lot about that. Um, so that was okay. You know, that's part of the journey, right? So you learn that life is filled with challenges and obstacles and your objective is to, okay, there's an object, there's an obstacle. What do you do? Is that going to be the end? And now am I going to turn into a bad person or now am I going to say, okay, as an obstacle, I got to find another way. And sounds so like he was away. sounds like he was jealous, man, that you were going to have a doctor's degree and this guy's your warden. Sounds I, like instead of him being positive and saying, "Look, there's people that can change their lives," because everyone questions how 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 well the prison system really allows people to rehabilitate, and to hear that the head of the prison would stop something like that when you've gone that far and he already knew how hard you were working. To me, well, it wasn't only it wasn't only the head of the prison. Okay, it's the whole country. Right? To this me, is it's a just different... so stupid, you know. It's just yeah. No this sense. is ni- this is mid nineteen nineties, and in fact, there was legislation. You're pretty young, so you probably don't remember this. Uh, you're I'm fifty six years old, so you're I'm a lot. I older hope I look you. like you when I'm fifty six. Yeah. So when I when I w- this is back in the ni- mid nineteen nineties, and it was a very different era. Newt Gingrich was the Speaker of the House. Those chubby the cheeks. Co- in the Congress. Yeah, those nice and Chevy chicks, yeah. He was arguing for legislation that would have made my crime a death penalty offense. Wow. And, First and offense, so it, death. Death, yeah, for kingpin, right? Because I was a drug, I was convicted of being a kingpin. And he wanted to make that a death penalty offense. And so there was, there was legislation to take education out of prisons at that time. That's what ended the Pell Grant. This is... Like it was, we needed to build more prison society felt. And so, so the warden was exercising the mandate that, that, that he's just a, you know, he's the head of the prison, but his, he's, he's exercising what's going on in the country. And so, yeah, he blocked me, but that is life. And we, as human beings, have to decide how are we going to respond to problems. And so I had to shift my focus at that time. And so I did. And I found new ways to grow. And that, again, I attribute to saying I'm grateful to have had that mindset because I shifted my focus and I began focusing on things that I could do and not on things that I couldn't do. Now, it wasn't overnight. You know, it took me six months, nine months, because I went through a real period of despondency when they stopped me from getting my PhD, but I, I shifted my focus and, and found a way and began focusing on business opportunities. And, and, and this was the dawn of the internet time. So I started to, I started like an investment career in prison and I uh, had a very successful investment career in prison where I made, took very little money that I earned from publishing, writing, uh, like I say, very little money, $2,000, and turn that into more than a million dollars in equity trading stocks from prison in internet stocks. On your time. own? Well, never on my own. You always have guidance, right? I mean, I, I, I educated myself and learned, but I'd have to call my sister and, 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 and co-opt her. So she had to open the brokerage account and, and, and she'd get the money. And then I'd tell her what to trade and I'd call her on the phone and tell her, okay, buy this stock. And, and I'd watch CNBC in prison on so TV. So you did this before the dot bomb. Sounds like you invested in those first like Yahoo's and all that stuff. That was actually my first position was Yahoo. And I started with $2,000, but then using margin, I kept leveraging my way up. Every time the stock rose, I'd get more buying power and I'd buy more and buy more and buy more. And, you know, I'd made, I, I, it hit a peak of more than a million dollars in equity within, in less than a year. And then the bubble hit, as you just described. And when that bubble hit, I lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but I, I had the, uh, I was fortunate to be able to exit with after paying the tax and, and still walking away with more than a hundred thousand dollars while I was in prison. 
you did better than most people that are outside <laughs> in liquidity. Yeah, but I still had thirteen. That's amazing, years man. That's I amazing. I still had many years in prison to go. So wow, I, I I didn't understand. So you had definitely had your relationship with your sister going, right? I had great relationships. I by then I'd reconciled with my family, and 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 they were proud the way that I had adjusted. And they could tell you changed, right? I mean, they they felt oh, yeah. it. They I'm saw writing. It. I'm publishing. I'm strong mentally i'm strong physically i feel i'm blessed and did you look at uh, it like that man after a while did you look at your time in jail literally as a blessing yeah i looked at this is where god wants me to be and this is where i have to grow he saved you yeah i felt this is where i have to grow and this is what i have to do and i have to live a life of never complaining and never being a victim of this is where i am and it's not fair and i i can't do that and be strong so i have to empower myself and be deliberate and make clear choices and that's what guided my decisions i and love so it I, I love it i love what i'm hearing i love it yeah so 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 that leads me to the market and then the market implodes and i have to do it again Okay, what am I going to do with my life? Like I'm down to like a hundred grand, which is a lot of money. I have to put that into perspective. Okay, wait a minute. I, I had nothing a year ago and now I've got a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Okay, it's gonna start my life. You were probably and feeling this thing a little bit that hey, I lost, you know, nine hundred because of the, the it, crash. For a while, that's what you're focusing on. You but lost you flipped it around and you said, Hey man, I shouldn't even have this hundred. Most of these guys don't maybe not even yeah. Probably you're probably one of the only prisoners in the history of prisons. Well, I don't know about that, but I know that I I knew that I had a hundred thousand. You're definitely in the minority, though. I mean, listen. I, oh yeah. To but generate I start, that kind of what capital. I, what I start recognizing? No, I start doing more to strengthen my mind. <clears throat> I start looking at how many people in society that have worked their whole life that don't have a hundred grand in cash, and I said, well, wait a minute. I'm gonna if I've got a hundred grand in cash <laughs> right now. I'm going to get out of prison. I still have 15 years to go or 13 years to go because it was halfway through at the time. So I had 13 years to go. So if I just go slow, I'm going to walk out of here with 250, 300,000 in cash. I can start my life. That was the plan for me. But God always gives us different things to do, right? So exactly. Then I shift to publishing and I begin writing books. And I write books for colleges because remember, I'd built this relationship with a lot of academics. And even though I stopped studying, I still had mentors in my life and they were professors from universities. And they introduced me to publishers and, and that led me to getting some publishing deals. And um, I published books that were used in universities across the country for students who were studying criminal justice. And so I develop a very strong support network where the students are writing to me and I'm writing to universities and I'm feeling stronger. I'm living a life. And it was through that process that um, I, I, I meet, I develop a relationship with a woman and indirectly through that process, I develop, she writes me this letter and that leads to a correspondence and it leads to a relationship and leads to a romance and I got married in prison. And during when I was in my six, 15th year, maybe I was in my 16th year. So I had 10 years to go. So I, I, I got married in, 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 in July, June of 2003, June 24th, 2003. And so I got married June, two, June of 2003, and I uh, have money in the bank, 100 grand. And I tell my wife then that we can use this money to start your life. So, because she was divorced, and, you know, I said, we have to start a life because I'm a prisoner and, and I can't be dependent on living on, you can't be dependent living on alimony or something like that if we get married. I have to be, supportive of you. And this is what I've got. And we've got to figure out a plan. And our plan's going to, you know, so she, we come up with a plan together and she decides to go to nursing school. And so I said, great, you can use the money that I have, go to nursing school, and I will figure out ways to make money in prison, which I did through publishing. 
And I said, I'm going to write about the prison system. And so that leads to like, you know, all, all these books, you know, I start writing books, like this becomes a big book. And tell us the names, man. Tell us the names of some of these. Yeah. Books. So I write a lot of books in prison for universities so first. Then when I get publishing credentials, I get an agent and she becomes my liaison. So I write by hand. She's typing for me and, and we send it to the publisher and they turn into books and the publishers. Yeah. But by the early 2000s, the internet becomes more mainstream, yeah. you know? And so I said, let's build our own publishing company. And I start ghostwriting books for other people in prison. And that, that is a fee-based business. So people would pay me to do this because I'm showing other people, look, you're in prison. You need to start doing what I do, which is restoring your character. Get ready for the next phase of your life. And the book isn't necessarily used to sell. This isn't a product for you to sell. It's the book is to sell you. So when you go back to society, they don't only look at you for the bad decisions that you made, but rather for what you have become. And that becomes a more inspiring and empowering story. And I wrote dozens of books and the money that I earned from writing those books supported my wife and she became a nurse and I built my life. And I started building my websites while I was in prison that she would run for me while I was in prison. And so then fast forward all of this and I get out of prison. I finish my sentence in, I come to the end of my sentence in 2012, 2013. And uh, I've got a very big following right now because I got married and Carol and I have worked together and I've got a lot of books out. And uh, I've got websites and people are following me um, and a journal. So I get out of prison in August, the August, the 13th, 2012, I transitioned from prison to a halfway house to serve my last year in a halfway house. And so while I'm in the halfway house, one of the people that was following me, and I remember by now I've got a very big support network because I've got books are used in universities across the country. Um, and so there's tens of thousands of people who know who I am, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in this specific niche. And one of the journalists, a journalist from the San Francisco Chronicle, which is the main newspaper in San Francisco, writes to me, when I'm in the halfway house, I say, hey, I've been following your journey for a long time. Would it be okay if we chronicled your story of what it's like to come back to society after a quarter century in prison? Because now the world's changed, right? There's the internet, right? I, I'd never used a, a cell phone before. My wife gave me a cell phone. I said, it's broken. There's no dial tone. <laughs> so I don't understand the world. Um, even though I've had a very big uh, internet presence, so to speak, I, I, I don't have the, the practical experience of doing it. I'd been writing by hand, sending it to my wife and she's been doing it. So this guy writes me this email and I said, of course. And so that leads to a big front page story in the Chronicle. And now all these universities know that I'm out of prison that had been using my books. And they start inviting me to come and speak at universities. And the first place I spoke was at uh, San Francisco State University. And I'm making the presentation and it turns out that the criminal justice professor said, no, we used your books when I was at Stanford. And I had a relationship with Stanford and Berkeley and well, schools all over the country. Phenomenal schools. But I, don't, I didn't know the people, all of them. And he was now a professor at San Francisco State. And he asked me, he said, well, would, would you like a job here? And, and I'm in the halfway house. So I'm thinking he wants me to be a landscaper or something, you know, because he thought I just got out of jail. And I said, um, what do you want me to do? And he says, no, we want you to be a professor here. <laughs> so <laughs> it was funny, right, to read it, think that they'd make me a professor. As of that day, I had never before in my life stepped foot on a university campus. And now I'm going to be a professor. So I what taught What did that feel like, man? It felt phenomenal. It was very fulfilling. Right. It was the fulfillment of a dream, I would say, because remember in jail, I said, I'm going to change my life. And now I'm out in society and I've got a lot of income opportunities. And you were and a guy who couldn't, who wasn't even good in regular school, like elementary I was terrible in, in, in high school. school. And now you're terrible. a professor at a very well-known yeah. university. Yeah, 
but but besides that, I'm I'm speaking at Stanford and Berkeley and and really universities across the country all right away. Judicial conferences. I'm meeting judges and and I'm creating. And I and and, and I remember my wife picked me up at the halfway house and driving me across to San Francisco, where I'm going to be in the halfway house, guys. I was in Atwater, which is the Central Valley of California, and we're driving to San Francisco. And we come across the Bay Bridge and I'm seeing the financial center of San Francisco, which is like driving into Manhattan. And I tell her, I said, within five years, I'll have my first million dollars. And, 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 uh, and, and, I, ha- and I had like 100 grand in the bank when I got out. So even though I'd put her through school, supported her with that 100 grand or given her the resources, she had to go through school. But she was a nurse now. And she had been a registered, by then she was a registered nurse. And I told her, I said, I'll, I need five years and I'll turn this hundred grand into a million dollars. And she said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, I will work as hard as I worked in prison out here and I'm going to figure it out. And this was at the end of the financial crisis. This was 2012. So the economy is just about to res- have its resurgence. So I begin architecting the plan of what am I going to do? And all these critical thinking skills that I have developed are really helpful at this stage because you've got to assess the market. What do I do? Uh, I don't want to do the stock market because it's very volatile. Although in retrospect, it wouldn't have been a bad thing. Go from the market from where it was at that time, Dow probably around seven, 8,000 to where it is today. Could have made a lot of money with a hundred grand in cash. Absolutely. But there was higher level of risk. So I didn't want to take that risk because I was 49 years old and I had a family, right? I mean, I've got, I'm married, so I needed to be, I, I didn't want to go in the market. I didn't want to go into business because I understood my weaknesses, right? I don't, I've never managed people. I've been in, I've never had a job, right? I've been in prison for 26 years. I don't know how to send an email. There's a lot I don't know. So I don't want to do stocks. I don't want to own a business at that time. And I, I, I realized what I want is to accumulate assets that have cash flow. And that's what gets me into real estate at that time. And I'd kind of been preparing for that during my final year before I transitioned out. And I have no credit. So when I say I have no credit, I mean, I have zero, zero, zero credit score, no credit. <laughs> is that even the case but, now? Or is, like, is, that, is that something that's imposed on people that were incarcerated or? No, I didn't exist. Just at the time, yeah, at the time, okay. Yeah, when I went to prison, there were no credit scores, right? So when I came out in 2012 and you plug my social security number in there, I have no credits at zero, zero, zero. I don't exist. I'm 49 years old and I don't exist. And so, um, but before I got out, I'd, I'd reached out. I'd had a very strong support network and I have a relationship with a very successful real estate developer in the Bay area. And I reach out to him and I tell him he wants me to work with him, but I want to build a career around my journey. And, and and so I tell him, no, I I want to do this. I said, but I want you to help me. And he says, how do you, how do you want me to help you? I said, I want you to sell me a house. And he kind of laughs and he says, well, do you have any money? And I said, I do have some money, but I don't want to use my money because I got to rebuild my life. I mean, I just got out of prison and I need this cash. And, and, and he laughs and, and he said, well, do you have any credit? I said, I do have credit. He said, what's your credit score? I said, it's zero, zero, zero. <laughs> and he laughs. And then I tell him, look, Lee, his name is Lee. I said, Lee, you're a businessman and you frequently do business deals without an expectation of a return for several years. And I want you to see me for who I'm going to be in five years. Don't look at me for who I am right now. If you see a good credit risk, I want you to invest in me. Sell me a house. I'll pay you for the house as soon as I can get credit. But I need this house in order to have credibility because I want to create programs to help teach and inspire people that if they're in struggle, they can become something more. And if a guy comes out of prison and he can do it, anybody can do it. But I need the track record. And so sell me this house. And he agrees to do it. So he finances me on a house. And I buy my first house at the end of the recession in San Francisco, which is a great market to own property. And a good time to buy. (laughs) The best time to buy. 
And then he helps me further by saying, well, look, if you could get through a quarter century in prison and be this motivated and energized, I need you to help my staff become that way. And he employs like 500 people. So he said, I want you to go and give this message into the marketplace at our stores, our various businesses, and I'm going to pay you for that. And I'm going to put that towards your down payment on this house. And so that's how I bought my first property. And then as that property started to appreciate in value, by the time I got credit, which took me about a year and a half or so to get credit, maybe, maybe a year. Yeah, a year. What did you do? Did you get like a secured credit card to start? To jumpstart that no, process? No, no. What happened is I had cash. Remember, I had a hundred grand in the bank. So uh, that's a lot of money to have just sitting in liquidity. And, I, and it, it would probably cost me 40 grand to get started because I had to buy a computer and I started building my business and buy clothes and I had nothing, right? So you spend 35, 40,000 to get settled, but I'm making money too. I'm doing business while I'm in the halfway house and speaking fees and consulting fees. And I'm making money, you know, right out of jail. I'm making, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm crushing it for a guy who's come out of prison. So the bank offers me a credit card application. And so I fill it out and they call me. It's the Bank of America. And they said, how is this possible that you have a zero, zero, zero credit score? You're 49 years old. <laughs> you've never bought a car. You've never had a utility bill. You've never, and I tell them the story. I said, well, look, I'll be honest with you. I was in prison for 26 years. And or at the time it was 25 years because I was still in the halfway house. I've been in prison for 25 years and I'm building my life. And, you know, I wrote books. I'm an author. I have an income. I've, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. And she said, okay, well, I'm going to give you a credit card with a thousand dollar credit limit. And that'll help you start building credit. And she gave me like coaching over the phone. She said, just, you know, don't spend more than a hundred dollars on your credit card and pay it back all the time. And you're so, you'll watch your credit score start to grow. And so I learned the principles of credit and grew my credit. And in a year, I probably had a 700 credit score or something. And that was enough to get financing on the house. But, but by the time that happened, that house that I bought for, I think 400,000 was worth like 550 because the market had started to rebound. And that's when I, I really understood the power of owning assets that grow in value. And that was my plan. So then I started to leverage, I financed that house, I paid off the developer, I bought another house and you know I did millions of dollars in deals that way and made a lot of money over five years while I was simultaneously building a business that would, digital business, it's prison professors where I create products and services that I sell to prison systems across the country to teach and inspire people who are living in struggle. And and that has been my plan. And that has been my path that carried me through 26 years in prison. And then now it's been eight years since I left prison, seven years since I finished my sentence. Because after I finished my sentence in August, on August the, thir- August the 12th, 2013. So just over seven years since I've been home. So prison professors is something that you've designed that and many others from the mindset of someone that is incarcerated to give them a way to turn that time into a positive experience in their life and an experience that can help them a stay out of prison when they get out b thrive and c live the rest of their lives in a better much better shape than when they first went in. So yeah, Prison Professors is one of those brands that does that. It creates digital products that teaches people, if you're going through any kind of struggle, right? It's not only prison. I mean, there are government investigations, right? Um, Business people that get involved in transactions that they don't understand, it could result in a government investigation from the Federal Trade Commission, from the Um, Securities and Exchange Commission, from the uh, Federal Drug Administration, from many different agencies. So civil investigations, we can help people understand that and train their staff so they can avoid it. We will work with law firms that have 
clients that are coming in that don't know how to position themselves for a lower sentence. We can work with um, individuals who are going into prison. And then we have products that we actually sell to institutions that they buy our products and play them in prisons to help people serving time. And that's prison professors. But we have other ones like white collar advice where we help consumers who find themselves in the crosshairs of government understand what can I do for mitigation. And then, so that's one business model that I really started to design while I was in prison that I've, we've executed with my partners, you know, since I've come home. And then I launch other businesses and uh, we spoke about it offline. One of them now is a, you know, I, I, I in, in teaching people how to deal with struggle, I always show them, I never ask anybody to do anything I didn't do and that I'm not still doing. And so I show people, how do you do this? And, and, and my main market is the, is this criminal justice system, but I want to transition into a consumer brand. Um, but I, I, so I launched a business called cbdtv.com and that's a business that's growing, but I, I did it all the same way with no money, just telling a story. And that's what really life is about. It's about telling your story. And you do that, I know really well with the comeback team. You show people how to reinvent themselves and, and build a story. And I think that's a human story. That's a message that I learned from Socrates and Nelson Mandela and Viktor Frankl and Malcolm X and so many other people helped me realize that, that regardless of what bad decisions we've made in the past, at any time we can turn the page and build a new story. Can always that, make a comeback. Can always make a comeback. And if we can learn that from other people, we learn to stop living with excuses and instead we figure out a way to navigate the pathway to prosperity. So currently, I'm, I'm just going to ask you flat out, uh, are you a millionaire? Um, yeah, I've got well over a million in assets. I can tell you that there are challenges. I, it's very public, right? Because I talk about this as my, as part of my plan and my story, right? I show people the story. And so like if you look at one of my other areas, michaelsantos.com, it shows the actual, all the deals. Every deal I did, it shows the investments that I made. It shows the amount that I paid. There's one on there where you'll see a cashier's check that I gave for $1.4 million, a cashier's check. It's on there. I said, look, this is how I made this investment. And this is what happened from that investment. And these are things that transpire, you know, but I, I'm been very blessed to be able to make money, lose money, make money, and show that it's always about a mindset. And, you know, I've made millions of dollars many times in my life <clears throat> and lost millions many times in my life. But one thing I know is that if you have the right mindset, you can become stronger. And that's what all of my products and services are about, are showing people how to do that. Michael, um, Going Making back, a comeback. <laughs> go, going back to your personal life for a moment. Um, you get out of jail. Your parents are still with us? No. Both of my parents. My father died when I was perhaps in my 15th year of imprisonment. It was very difficult for him to deal with my challenges of my imprisonment. He was very close to me as a you know, um, the only son of a Cuban immigrant. I was very, he, was, he lived through me. And it was very painful for him to um, deal with the fact that I was in prison. Um, but he saw me growing and he was proud of me, but he suffered and he contracted Alzheimer's and, and that led to an early death for him. And then my mother, fortunately, was with me until she saw me come out and she saw me become financially successful when I come out and, and, and well-received in the, in the community and, um, but then she got cancer and she passed away in 2017. Sorry for your loss, but at least your father, even though you were still inside 15 years in, he knew you were on the right path. He saw oh, he knew. Yeah. He was very proud of me and, 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 and I was living to earn that trust and to prove worthy. So look, there's no regrets here other than the bad decisions that I made as a young man 
But if there's a story in that and it helps other people who are living in struggle make the comeback, I'm very grateful. I don't even know how you found me back, but I'm glad that you have given me an opportunity to share this story with your uh, very impressive audience. I know that you have uh, a story of resilience and a passion of wanting to help people in struggle. And, and I consider it an honor that you have allowed me to share this story with you. Uh, and your team. And, uh, and uh, I hope that it, it serves a, a, a good purpose. It's one of my favorite stories so far, to be honest with you. And I've had some extraordinary people here. Uh, your mindset throughout this whole thing is an inspiration to anybody. Uh, despair, I always say it comes from the devil. He wants you to give up. You right away, you took this big mistake you made, you turned it around, you changed the way you were thinking, you read books to help you change the way you were thinking, you structured your life. You found whatever positive you could in one of the worst environments possible. Okay, at least I don't have to just sit here and rot all day. Let me use this time and get something out of it. Let me not just make it dead time, literally. Let me not, let me not just decay. Let me rise above this place. And when I do get out of this place, I'm going to hit the ground running. And you know what? You've, with all those years you were inside, you accomplished more than most people ever will on the outside. That's a fact. The, the accomplishment. Because they're prisoners in their, they are prisoners in their own minds. It doesn't matter that physically you were incarcerated. People are prisoners to their own minds, their own habits, I, and their own beliefs. Yeah. So as like, a, you know, a, a, an important story analog here is, you know, you're right. I've met more people in society since my relief that are in a far bigger prison than I was ever in because they, they, of the way they think. And they're imprisoned because maybe no fault of their own. You know, they lost a child and they couldn't get out. of. They can't get back on track. And it's they hard. got divorced and they, they can't deal with it. They um, have a substance abuse issue. They have uh, a mental health crisis. They have an issue and they are in prison because they do not know how to navigate their way to prosperity or to success. And, but I, Yes, that is really the, the success for me is to help more people reach their highest potential. My story is really a vehicle with hopes to, to give hope to people because I got hope. I got hope from Socrates. I got hope from Mandela. I got hope from Plato. I got hope from people that inspired me to become better. Gandhi, who said, be the change that you want to see in the world. And that is really what my life is about. Uh, have I earned millions of dollars and transacted millions of dollars and lost millions of dollars? Yes. Do I, I have a, 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 I'm very blessed every day, but everything that I have is a tool. It is a tool to help more people see, wow, he's not a guy that's filled with happy talk. You know, he's so, so for me, I, I, I live in a beautiful home. I drive a great car. I, I have a great life. I work from home. I've got freedom, but I work seven days a week and my workday starts at four in the morning. Why? Because I never ask anybody to do anything that I'm not doing. And if you're willing to pay that price, you can become success as you define success. Uh, and, and so here's something I'd like to share with your team at the comeback story, right? Life is about starting with defining success. And I'm gonna use a little prop here. It's a simple um, tripod, right? But this is the story that I have learned and that I live by. For me, I had to start by defining success. What is it? What is it? And for me, in the beginning, when I was in prison, it was said, I'm gonna come out of prison with my dignity intact and an opportunity to live as a law-abiding contributing citizen. I'm not gonna be defined by the bad decisions that brought me into prison. You, we have to define success. We're gonna define success. If we learn how to do that, that is the first step. And that strategy of defining success might be, in five years, I wanna be in a better job. In five years, I wanna have a better marriage. In five years, I wanna be in better fitness, okay? That's the first step. Then you've got to have a strategy and you've got to document that strategy. For me, success was I'm going to come back to society strong with my dignity intact and be able to work. And I documented that strategy. And I said, the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to get an education. I'm going to contribute to society and I'm going to build a support network. Those were the tools and tactics that I was going to develop. And that's what you have to do. However you define success, 
create a strategy and document it, develop tools, tactics, and resources that you can use. And then the third prong is to measure your progress every single day. Because if you know where you're going to be in five years, then you know where you need You know where you need to be in one year. You know what you need to do tomorrow. That's why I get up in the morning because I've got this process. And because of that process, this thing will stand strong, right? If I lose one of the things, this doesn't stand. You need, we all need this process to be successful. That's what I share. And that's a message that is not applicable to people in prison. It's applicable to anybody in struggle. And if your audience visits the Prison Professor's YouTube channel, they will see people who've come out of prison that have gone on to become lawyers, successful business leaders, accomplished professionals, even though at one point in their life, they were in deep, deep struggle. We all can become part of the comeback story. And hopefully they get an opportunity to share that story with you, Vec. You heard it here first, a man who spent a quarter of a century in prison He worked hard. He never gave up. He found purpose, even in one of the most horrible situations a human being can be in. He was successful. He found ways to generate money, even while he was in in prison. He got an education. He got a master's degree. He came out and right away hit the ground running. We're witnessing, he's already made a comeback, but we're going to witness this get bigger and bigger i have a feeling we're going to be seeing michael all over the place very soon and then the way we like to wrap out this show this is proof that no matter what you've been through in life no matter how bad it gets no matter how hopeless it may seem as long as you have air in those lungs you can always make a michael you can always make a what a comeback (laughs) there you go finally someone gets it right Michael, thank you for your time. We'll be in touch, and uh, we look forward to having you. When you come to New York, we'll bring you back into the studio. We'd love to be part of the Comeback team. Thanks so much for having me back. Take care of yourself, and God bless, and we'll be in touch. God bless you and your audience. Till the next time, this is Beck Lover. Have a great day. Beck Lover.